For those that I have not met before, my name is Frank Ferry. So I'm the state representative for the 142nd district. Uh, that area comprises the majority of Middletown Township, Langhorne Borough, Langhorne Manor, Lower Southampton, and uh, Southampton Township. So for those of you that are from, uh, it covers some of the Levittown sections, but if you're from Pendale, Humeville, Warminster, uh, and some of the Levittown sections, you may not be in my legislative district, um, but I still welcome you for coming here, and hopefully this is a great experience for you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Katera, Dr. McGee, uh, Mr. Heaney, Mr. Ball, Mr. Jones, uh, the faculty, um, and everybody that made today possible. This is our first time that we are doing a legislator for a day, so I hope it's a, a great and rewarding experience for you. Uh, one of the things I've seen in my nine years in office is a lot of younger people are, not, are becoming less and less civically engaged, um, engaged in politics, engaged in coming out to vote, and, and those are all very important things. So today, one of our goals is for you to learn a little bit about the legislative process. Um, we're doing it in a very condensed time frame, but um, hopefully you take away some, some great learning experiences from this. Um, I also want to thank the Shami School District as our host, um, our various volunteers that are going to be staffing the committee meetings, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, as well as my uh, great staff for, for taking the time to organize this event and, uh, and put it together. Um, the film crew that's here is actually a film crew from the House of Representatives, so they're going to be filming the event today. Uh, they'll be in and out of some of the committee meetings, so they're not going to have 100% of everything that goes on, but eventually they're going to edit this in, into a program. It's going to be up on, on my website, which is repferry.com, uh, and I believe both school districts are going to be putting it up on their TV channels and their websites, so you and your family and friends will be able to uh, share in, in watching what, what transpired here today. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over now to uh, Lieutenant Governor Jim Cauley. Um, okay, former Lieutenant Governor Jim Cauley, thank you. Sorry, you're still governor to us. Um, and, and Governor Cauley is going to be explaining the House rules, bless you, that were included in your packet. Uh, Jim was born and raised right here in Bucks County. Uh, he served as the Levittown. Chief of Staff. Levittown. He served as the Chief of Staff to uh, Senator Tommy Tomlinson. Uh, he also served as one of our Bucks County Commissioners. Uh, he served as our Lieutenant Governor for four years. Uh, and his previous position after serving as Lieutenant Governor was Executive Director for the United Way. And he recently uh, was hired for a new position, which is the VP of Institutional Advancement at Temple University. So um, it's a newly formed job there. They condense some job positions, but uh, it's, a, it's a very special job. He's going to be responsible for doing a lot of great things to advance Temple University. Is anybody here going to Temple or considering going to Temple? I got accepted. Where, where, where are more hands? I don't see it. Everybody. <laughs> All right. That's what I want to do. All right. Well, well, well Jim, Jim's going to be an important role at Temple for, for Temple's future. And I'll turn the floor over to uh, Governor Cauley now. Thank you. What I thought we might do. Uh, is just begin uh, with understanding a little bit about what it is that you know about the process. Have any of you ever, for any reason, had occasion to come across parliamentary procedure in, in a meeting? It's kind of the way, now, what's interesting about parliamentary procedure, and that's really what we're gonna talk about for the next half hour, and the only way this is really gonna work well is if you ask questions as they come up in the traditional way, raise your hand, you'll be recognized, don't shout out, all that kind of good stuff. And that is the key to what it is that we're gonna talk about as kind of the rules of the game that you're going to be playing a little later on. Parliamentary procedure is courtesy, is respect, the House rules are also supposed to reflect those same values of respect, courtesy, allowing everyone the opportunity to voice their opinion, regardless of how aggressively you feel to the contrary that they do. You've got to try to reserve those emotions, hopefully to hear them out, but certainly never to attack. And that's really what it's about. So when you look at a couple of the key phrases that were provided to you earlier, now depending on who gets picked to chair your proceedings after your committee meetings, you will address them obviously as Mr. or Madam Speaker, depending on their sex. 
Uh, now, this person is very, very important. Now, I did not have the privilege of serving as the Speaker of the House of Representatives, but in my role as Lieutenant Governor, I did preside over the State Senate. And the leader of legislative proceedings in the State Senate is actually referred to as the President of the Senate. Um, and I can tell you it gets uh, rather comfortable to have people refer to you as Mr. President every once in a while. Um, but uh, in this case, when you seek to be recognized and you address the chair, uh, it will be uh, by addressing him or her as Mr. or Madam Speaker. Now, aside from guiding the flow of discussion, this person serves a lot of important uh, A pinnacle, if you will, a, a very important point in trying to move things along. We don't want, one of the things that does happen when you start going down the road of parliamentary procedure is, and I've seen it from time to time, is that people become a slave to those rules. The rules are there to help you to guide to an ultimate decision. The rules are not there so that you must follow them and it slows everything down. The key is to move things along, but to move things along in an orderly fashion. And that's really the responsibility of the presiding officer, the speaker. And that leads us to those next comments, without objection, so ordered. That basically means if there's something that universally during the discussion on whatever the issue might be that everybody agrees to, then the chair is going to try to move it along and just say, you know what, let, uh, there's no real discussion, there's no real debate on this. Without objection, let's move to the next issue. Now, operative in that sentence, doesn't often happen, but I guess it could, is without objection. Well, if there is an objection, you stand up and you say, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I object. And then that kind of slows things down for further debate if you feel it's warranted because don't forget ultimately all of you are here not only in theory to represent your own thoughts and your own ideas but you all represent constituents there are imaginary constituents out there who are going to work right now trying to pay their mortgage trying to meet their bills and they're counting on all of you to make the decisions that are gonna be in their best interest. So if you think you need to stand up and object, you do so. Again, some of this is just very kind of housekeeping. Some of these phrases that you're gonna hear, things like the chair refers the following bills to committee, uh, which the clerk will read. That basically is just putting you on notice that there are bills out there and really all it's going to be is like HB1, HB2, HB3 are going to be referred to the Committee on Education, HB4 and 5 are going to be referred to the Committee on Rules, whatever it might be. And really that just puts all of you as members of the legislature on notice that all of those ideas that those bills represent are in play. And if you're interested in one or all of them, Figure out who the committee members are, if you're not on the committee, and go talk to them about how that bill is progressing. Will the House agree to the bill agreed to? Now, here's another interesting one. This is more notice for all of you. A bill in the House and the Senate in our state can't be considered, can't be passed, unless it's read three times in front of the full body, in front of the full chamber, either the House or the Senate. Now, the first time may very well just be exactly that. Uh, the clerk calls, uh, or the chair calls on the clerk to call up Bill HB1. Will the House agree to the bill agreed to? Now that happens almost all in one phrase because again, it's the chair's desire, it's the speaker's desire in this case to move the process along. But again, it's more notice. It's more letting you know that sometimes the issues 
aren't all that weighty for the rest of the state, but some of them are pretty important. And it's giving you an opportunity to know that it's coming, that this issue is coming, that the debate is coming, that it's time for you to prepare. It's time for you to do more homework to know what is in the best interests of your constitu constituents. I move to recommit, ah, during debate, very powerful motion. If debate is getting bogged down on an issue, right, and or you're not too sure that this idea is fully baked, has been thought through all the way, you can motion to recommit. Now what that means is it gets sent back to committee. Bills get sent to committee, the committee does its work, sends it to the floor, and sometimes when it's the thought of a majority of that body, that it's not ready yet to be voted on, it gets sent back. That helps to make a better bill, at least in theory, and I will tell you that it is a tool if you're losing the debate and you're afraid that this piece of legislation, which may not be good for your constituents, but may in fact be gathering support from others, that you're gonna lose that final vote, you can try this. You can try sending the bill back in hopes that enough people will say, well, I might vote for it in its current form, but maybe, maybe he's right, maybe she's right, maybe it needs more time. Again, a tool, a way in which you can best represent your constituency. Point of order. Now, this brings us into that whole area that I was talking about earlier, about um, courtesy and respect. You may get, it may surprise you, but you may get actually very passionate today about a position that you take. And as passionate as you get, there might be somebody who is absolutely opposed to your position with the same amount of passion. The thing that you cannot do, the thing that you must not do, the thing that breaks down the process is to make the issue about the person and attack the person. Now, there are creative and interesting ways in which people can do that. You can call somebody stupid without calling them stupid by simply saying something like, Mr. Speaker, is the gentlelady aware that 80% of the people that have her position have an IQ of 50 points or lower? You can do those sorts of things. That kind of, however, skirts the line. What you cannot do is say, Mr. Speaker, is the gentlelady aware that she's stupid? You can't purposely attack somebody. And if it happens, and from time to time, in, you know, in the argument, you say stuff that maybe you shouldn't. The person who has been wronged can immediately stand up, say point of order, state that point of order, I've been personally attacked by the speaker, but by the individual who's speaking. And then this, it's the speaker's obligation to first admonish and then perhaps do something even more stringent, a little more tough, if, uh, if the person who made the slip up in the first place turns it into a habit. So that is something that can happen right away. You can jump to your feet right away in order to be recognized in, by the speaker and simply shout out point of order, I feel like this person has gone too far. Now, the next piece, the chair recognizes the gentleman or the gentlewoman. That is critical as well. You do not have a voice, except for what I just said about the point of order, you do not have a voice on the floor of the assembly. You do not have a voice in the chamber until the presiding officer says, yeah, I recognize you. You may stand now and you may speak about what it is that you want. Again, to protect the process, to hopefully move things along, because if everybody wanted to talk at the same time, 
very little would get done. Would the gentleman or the gentlelady please stand for interrogation? Now what will happen is if somebody has either written a bill or written an amendment to that bill and there is another member of the legislature who wants to ask, how did you come up with it? What were the ideas that you thought about? How did you go through the process? Whatever the questions might be, you can't directly interact with that other person on the floor. You've got to go through the presiding officer, through the chair, and you ask, will that individual stand for interrogation? Will they stand up and answer questions? And they either, you can say no, it happens. It is not, um, it's not preferred, it's kind of frowned upon, but you could say, no, I'm not gonna answer any of your questions. Kind of disrespectful, uh, both to that individual and the people they represent. But if you say yes, the person asking the questions will say, Mr. Speaker, is the gentlelady aware that if this bill passes, 80% of Pennsylvanians will be out of a job in a year. And then it goes to the woman who made the amendment or who uh, wrote the bill and she then answers the question and the flow of debate goes through until the person who has asked for the other person to stand up and answer questions is satisfied that all of their questions have been answered. Then they both sit down and things continue on. Will the House agree to the amendments which the clerk has read? Again, very simple. Very similar to will the House agree to the bills? A way in which notifying you that a bill that perhaps previously you supported or pre previously you opposed has now been amended. It's on you to figure out what those amendments are because really all you're going to be told is Amendment number A572. Well, what does A572 do to the bill? You've got to figure that out. You've got to find out what that's all about. But again, putting you on notice, letting you know that you have an obligation, that there actually is work involved in being a representative of the people. The House will come to order. You'll hear that at the beginning of the proceeding, and you may hear that during some of the more aggressive debate. That is the chair's way of reminding all of you that there are rules and that he or she is in charge. And it's time for everybody to quiet down, stop having side conversations, sit down and listen to the person who has the floor who is speaking at the time. It is exactly that. It is a call to everyone coming back to order to try to reorganize the chaos in any given moment. The question is, will the House agree to the bill? This is a big motion. This is a big statement from the chair because this is it. This is whether or not a bill is going to pass. Your last shot and the yes or the no means you're either for whatever it is, you're against it. It doesn't say, okay, now everybody who's for it, raise their hand, everyone who's against it, raise. that's not the way it works. It's, will you agree to the bill? Will you agree to the amendment to the bill? Also sometimes very significant because there are some amendments that vastly change what the initial intent was of the bill. So paying attention to that, understanding that, and recognizing when the vote comes what your position needs to be for the people you represent is critical. I move that the question be placed upon the table and we'll take its sister right on, uh, or, or, oh no, we'll leave, we'll leave the last one just so that everyone's clear. Uh, laying a bill upon the table, again, another tool that you have. If you think that things aren't necessarily going your way and this is going to be a detrimental thing for the people that you represent and or 
you think that the idea is pretty well baked, that going back to a committee wouldn't exactly be helpful, but that all you're doing is getting wrapped in the debate and everyone's saying the same thing in different language over and over and over and over and over again, then you just say, I'd like this bill to be tabled. It's basically time out. Putting a bill in time out, putting it off to the side and saying, we may get back to this. We probably will, but we may not. So we're just gonna put it off to the side and we're gonna move on with the rest of the proceedings. And taking a bill off the table, again, taking it out of timeout, taking it out of the penalty box and putting it back in play. To, again, tools to uh, effective ways in which you can effectively represent your constituents and or move the flow of debate. And then finally, I move that the House do now adjourn. That's it, game over for that legislative session. It's over for that day. Now, a lot of what we just talked about, you will find in the next page of how to do what it is that we talked about that people will do that you will hear today. Uh, and the order in which those bill, or excuse me, those motions take precedence, you will find in the next two pages. The rules of the House take a couple of minutes to familiarize yourself with the rules of the House. Again, a further definition of how it is that the game is going to be played, how it is that everything is going to move forward today, and how it is that all of you are going to be effective in what it is that you're going to do for the people that you represent. Um, and as, uh, as I said earlier, you will find a lot of the language that we've already gone over, including final passage, amendment, uh, the uh, presentation of motions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all in the rules. Now, I would draw your attention to Rule 9, just for a moment, because with all these motions that we've talked about, there is what's called an order of precedence, an order, a ranking of what motions are more, rise to the top quicker than others. Take a look at the one through five there. The motion to lay upon the table in the House of Representatives is a very powerful motion. Again, when we were talking about if you don't think that you're, you're going to carry the day if you don't think that this bill is in the best interest of the people you represent, if you think you got to get a little breather, let the air clear a little bit, an important motion. Motion for the previous question. There's one we have not yet gone over, but again, a very, very powerful one. That's the opposite of laying on the table. That's the, sounds like most people are with me. Sounds like we're moving in the right direction, or frankly, I am just so tired of talking about this issue over and over and over again. Let's just have a vote. That's what previous question is. Why they call a previous question, I have no idea. Why they don't just say, hey, let's have a vote, I don't know. But that's what it is. It is returning to what originally started the debate in the first place. That question and calling it to a vote. You have the ability, you as an individual rep have the ability to say enough, let's just vote it. And it's by moving that previous question. Postpone, it's kind of weak. Postpone is, is kind of like, yeah, let, exactly what it says. Let's just put it off till a date in the future. Eh, have the discussion especially today, you're not going to postpone it to another day. Today is it for you. So let's just skip over that one and let's just go to commit and recommit, which we know, right? If a bill has never been 
to a committee, you can send it to that committee. That's the bill, uh, that's uh, the vote or the motion to commit. Recommit is sending it back to the same committee for further, further study. We've had that discussion. Then motion to amend, pretty obvious. You know, I'd like to uh, amend House Bill whatever um, to read the following. I think that that's uh, pretty self-explanatory if in fact it does not read what it is that you want it to read. So let's stop and let's see if there are questions. There's a lot that's been thrown at you and you'll get it as you go along, trust me. Nobody, and I mean nobody, gets it all right away. Um, there are folks who spend years and years and years and a career uh, in trying to uh, get these rules down. Uh, and uh, still not all the time does it work out. But with that, questions on the way in which things will flow and proceed today. It was that good, right? I was that thorough, right? I was that inspirational. Come on, questions, yes. Yes, you will, from here, Representative, they will go to... Break into committees, they've all been assigned committees, they have two bills per committee, so they can amend it, vote it out. You're going to have at it. It, it, it. One of the glories of the committee structure is that you have the ability to test out arguments uh, and ideas to try to find allies and to understand who might be in opposition to you early, before you hit the floor. It also, the, the committee process, really allows you to dig deep into an issue. You know, in our state there are 203 House members trying to have a discussion among 203 very intelligent, very articulate, very passionate people is hard. And then there's Frank. Um, it's hard, it's hard. And the the committee structure allows for a greater debate, a, 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 a digging deeper, and that's really what the rest of uh, the rest of the representatives rely on the members of those committees to have those discussions and to have that interaction. So yes, the answer is you are going to have that, and the other thing too, discussion one on one or a group in an informal way among representatives often ends up being extremely helpful in carrying the day. Other questions? Yes, sir. So on this chart, uh, it says that uh, if there is a second needed, so uh, what is that? The second is I motion to recommit House Bill 2 to the Committee on Education. That would require another member of the legislature to agree with you that, that's some, that you would second that motion, that you also are in support of that motion. There are some motions that don't require a second. There are some motions that don't require anybody else's support, and there are some motions that are so preeminent that there isn't even debate. The motion to table is undebatable. You don't talk about whether or not you're going to send it to the table. You're going to put it in timeout. You just vote it. Yes, we're going to do that, or no, we're not. Um, as you go through the process, you'll get, you'll get all of that down as to what is and what is not. It's always safe to have somebody nearby who you know is going to second just in case you need it, um, but sometimes you don't. Other questions? With that, good luck to all of you. Don't forget that as much as you may have passion for an issue yourself, it's about respect of other people's ideas. Listen, listen to what it is that they are saying. You may learn something. Uh, and likewise, don't forget as well that even with 
your own feelings and your own ideas and your own thoughts. You're here to represent a group of people that are relying on you. Don't let them down. Thank you. I present to the House, House Bill number four. Uh, it is immunity for first responders. This bill provides for immunity for a police officer or other public safety professional to remove a pet who is confined in an unattended vehicle if they believe they are in danger or suffering. So this bill would um, allow first responders to save people's pets without fear that they are going to be penalized for doing so. So say a first responder does break into the vehicle, um, would the person reliable for the pet, would they be compensated for um, their, the damage of their vehicle or would they be held accountable for what they did to the animal? Uh, they would be held, uh, as the bill stands right now, they would be held accountable for uh, what they did to the animal just s simply because um, if they had not left the animal in the car, then the first responder would not have to break in to save the animal. And then how, how harsh would the charges be towards the penalty? Like a fine or? Um, I don't know, prison? As, as the bill stands right now, there there is no penalty for uh, if a first responder were to save your animal. This bill provides that current state licensed casinos will be a allowed to operate up to five satellite casinos separate from the main casino and up to 50 slot machines and 100 table games per station, spurt satellite oh, location. There's a lot of people in Pennsylvania and if you have them spread out then it'll benefit everyone because easy access to a casino doesn't have to travel far. You know, we, we have a worry on our side of the aisle that this is just right, ripe for creating more addiction problems with, uh, with gaming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is there some common ground we can work together on to try to help out, um, you know, those who could become addicted to gambling? Representative, you'd be willing to take a portion of the funds that, um, that would be raised by this bill and put some more into the problem gambling? I don't think that'd be a bad idea, but... Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> Door tanning regulation act, which requires salons to be regulated, inspected, post warning signs, and requires minors 17 years of age to have written authorization of the person's parent or legal guardian, indicating that the parent or legal guardian consents to the use of a tanning facility by the child. Children 16 years of age and younger will be prohibited from the use of a tanning facility. Mandatory education about the dangers of tanning. In tenth grade. In tenth grade and tanning salons will require written information, will be, will be required to provide written information about the dangers of tanning to the minor children. Representative, you want to introduce your bill to the committee, please? With this bill, um, there will be certain advantages that uh, surpass the disadvantages. Uh, advantages that it cleans up the environment, uh, which it doing so by that it doesn't, um, it encourages people to, to be smart about what they're doing and, and when they buy plastic bags to take care of them and dispose them properly. Um, and also the bill um, for limiting or, or taxing plastic bags would also increase our economic growth uh, minorly, uh, as we've seen with the soda tax, which hasn't um, g given us much, much support. Uh, however, I, I feel that there are certain benefits. Out of the Cleveland area, about a town that has a red light camera that raises 95% of their entire town budget comes from red light cameras at one intersection because they know people's speed. It's not really about safety for them, it's about balancing their budget. They don't want to vote to raise taxes, so instead they just keep grabbing every motorist that comes through their town and getting them with a red light camera. If you're, you know, committing a, a crime, what's, what's, the, um, what's wrong with the local government making revenue off your wrongdoing that it's a choice that you you it's a choice that you made yourself so it's not even just speeding through because they're you know going to speed through it they're just choosing to go through the red light because it's wasting your time against okay we'll call house bill one and we'll recognize representative sheet um, so I'm Representative Sheed uh, from the Consumer Affairs Committee, 
And this bill, Mr. Speaker, this bill uh, prohibits a political subdivision, a county, city, borough, township, or school district from imposing a ban, fee, surcharge, or tax on a recyclable plastic bag supplied by a retail establishment. Uh, initially, I did support this bill, but I now, after consideration, oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Will the House agree to the bill? Now, at this point in time, that's where if somebody wants to amend it, they raise their hand. If nobody's going to move forward with amendments, we're going to move to a vote, and we're going to vote by hands. Um, and the ladies there are going to do a quick count of the hands so we know if it passes or, or fails. So does the, does the body agree to the bill? Agreed to? All those in favor? Are they for amendments back there? Oh, all those in favor of the bill, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay, so clearly that bill goes down. So that bill is defeated. <laughs> the House will now call up uh, House Bill 2 as amended by the Gaming and Oversight Committee. And Representative Car Calero, excuse me if I put your name, Clorio. Should I stand? Yes, if you can. <laughs> Hello, everybody. All right. I'm Representative Calorio, and our bill was, or this bill provides that current state licensed casinos will be allowed to operate to three satellite casinos separate from the main casino and include up to 500 slot machines and 100 tables, um, table games per satellite location. Two to three must be built on brownfields. 2% of the gross terminal revenue will go to the problem gaming fund. Okay. Is the bill agreed to? Recognize the representative. So Brownfield site is so Brownfield site is a so during the sure, I'll give a brief recap. So during the Industrial Revolution of America, they built all these manufacturing sites and eventually they went to dust and everyone left the sites, but what's left is just cleared out land that is able to be built on. So it like it stops from having to clear down like forest to build a casino. Yeah. Okay. So it's good for the environment. And, um, many Yikes. Um, <laughs> if, the, if the bill doesn't cover it, no. If the bill doesn't cover it, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what would really happen was um, you, what would happen in the formality of Harrisburg is you would stand and you would ask if, uh, if the gentleman would stand for uh, interrogation. So what you actually just did was, I'm just telling you how this all really works. So you would ask if the gentleman stands for interrogation. He can say no. Um, and not stand for interrogation. Actually, we had a member that actually said no to me on a debate earlier this year, and the guy was really being a jerk. Um, right, Hugh Allen? Um, yeah, so the member was being a jerk, and, and, and he got the mic and made a whole big speech that was full of nonsense, so I really wanted to challenge him on his speech. Um, it was about funding for the veterinary school at the University of Pennsylvania, which is our only veterinary school in the whole Commonwealth, and not only do they train our vets there, um, they also do a lot um, to, to battle disease for animals. They do a lot of great work with agriculture, and it's very important to fund them. And this guy was against funding them, but then he wouldn't stand for debate. So, um, but what would happen in practicality is you would say, um, Mr. Speaker, is the gentleman willing to stand for debate or general lady? And I would ask, and obviously you would have said yes. And I'm just telling you the process. We don't need to do that here. But you said yes, so that was interrogation that you just did. So, uh, does anybody else wish to be recognized on the bill? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the problem gaming fund and what is it used for? <laughs> Sorry. I go as as I can. So the problem gaming fund is um, it is a like almost like a rehab but for uh, for addiction gambling. And what, ha what usually happens is, so someone will be addicted to something, and what happens is there will be a second thing that they're addicted to, because like, it's like an addictive personality. So they will be addicted to like, alcohol, but then they'll also become addicted to gambling. So what it does, it, it provides like, it's like, a, it's like a rehab for them almost, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, it's like the 1-800-GAMBLER number, um, so people can call and get help. It funds all that kind of stuff, the public awareness about gaming addiction. You may see the commercials on TV and whatnot. It's that's what's for. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Okay. The, uh, all those in favor of House Bill 2 will raise their hands.
Now, while the counters are counting, what actually happens in Harrisburg is we have buttons in front of us. Green is yes, red is, or green is red, yes, red is no. And we have a light up board and our name changes to color to represent what our number is. And it actually tabulates the number. It has like a running counter on the top. So we don't quite have to do it as primitively as we're doing here with tick marks. But I, I would say the bill passes. There's a lot of hands here. So the House bill, House bill number two passes and it'll be reported to the Senate. And by the way, just to, just to figure this in, so you have committee votes on these bills. So the bills get posted, they go to committee, they can be amended in committee. When they come out of committee on the first day, they're read out of committee, the bill isn't physically read, but they're read over the desk. So that's the first day. That, and they're not, they don't have to be consecutive days, by the way. This, the, when the bill's on second consideration, that is when the bill can be amended on the floor. So the non-committee members that weren't part of the committee process have a chance to amend the bill. They have to have their amendments filed by two o'clock the day before. So then the bill gets amended on the second day. The third day is final passage, either as amended or, or however the bill came out of committee if it wasn't amended. So it's a several day process. So we're kind of condensing that all into one moment here, one session. So we're doing first, you'll have a chance to amend it a second, and then we're obviously doing final consideration. With that, we'll pull up House Bill 3, as, re as reported out of the Health Committee, uh, Representative McCollum. I'm Representative McCollum from the Health, uh, Health Committee, and our act uh, bill is on a tanning regulation, and this bill establishes that the Indoor Tanning Regulation Act, which requires salons to be regulated and inspected, post warning signs, and requires minors 17 years of age to have written authorization of one of the parents a uh, person's parent or legal guardian indicating that the parent or legal guardian consents to the use of the tanning facility by the child. Children 16 e uh, years of age and younger will be prohibited from using a tanning facility. Age restriction will not apply to spray tanning. Schools will be required to provide education to 10th grade students about the dangers of tanning and tanning salons will be required to provide educational information to the parents of minors who are using a ta tanning facility. Tanning salons must verify the age of a client by requiring the client to produce an ID. Thank you. Does any member wish to be recognized on House Bill 3? With that, is the bill agreed to? All of those in favor will raise their hands. Can you hold them high just so they can see over there? All those opposed? I believe the bill passes. Moving on, uh, call up House Bill number four, Representative Whitman. I'm Representative uh, Whitman and I'm presenting House Bill number four. This bill provides for immunity uh, for a police officer or other public safety professional to remove a pet who is confined in an unattended vehicle. If they believe they are in danger or suffering, the animal must be showing signs of distress and pet is defined as a domestic animal. Does anyone wish to be recognized on House Bill 4? Um, in this case, uh, most states have provisions for those who are not um, legal first responders, as in not police officers or um, medics, uh, to save animals and cars, in which, for example, Texas allows you to break um, a window of a car if an animal is in distress and you take a picture to prove such. How do you um, account for such in instances? Will the representative stand for interrogation? Yes. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um. What a person should do is if they do see a animal suffering in a vehicle, in an un unattended vehicle, they would uh, call authorities to get a first responder to arrive at the scene, and then they will carry out the procedure to rescue the animal. Does that answer the gentlewoman's question? Is that not a waste of police resources? Is that a question for the maker of the bill? Yeah. Um, the, I believe that's subjective. Um, the police are here to serve and protect, uh, and the police are responsible for protecting, pro uh, to help people protect their property, such as if there are stolen items. So uh, protecting people's pets uh, may fall into that if you believe so. 
Does anyone else wish to be recognized on the bill? Okay, we'll call up House Bill 4 for final consideration. All those in favor shall raise their hands. All those opposed? House Bill 4 passes. Trust me, it's not this easy in the real world in the House of Representatives, I assure you. Um, the speaker calls up House Bill number five, as reported from the Transportation Committee. Representative McDevitt. Um, Representative McDevitt, on behalf of the Transportation Committee, and this bill allows for an individual to get their permit at age 15, and at age 16, or one year after they receive their permit, they can get their license. And the requirement for anyone to get their license includes uh, increased test scores and increased hours. Does anyone wish to be recognized on House Bill number five? Um, how will you know that they record 40 hours of driving? The gentleman's willing to stand for interrogation, correct? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who couldn't hear it, the question, the question was, how will we know that the individual put in 40 hours of training, correct? <laughs> yes. So in the, yeah, so in, what, what generally happens is um, a couple different things. One, you're looking at a three sentence bill right now that in reality would probably be at least seven pages, four pages, five pages. And uh, one thing we didn't include here, a lot of things have definitions um, in them, which we'll get to, well actually talking about the hot dogs and cars, the bill that previously passed, um, there would be a definition for what a domestic animal is. Or there'd be a citation in there if domestic animal has already been defined in, in a previous section of statute and whatnot. So for this, what I would presume, and we'll help the gentleman out a little bit, what, what, what I would presume is it would spell out the 40 hours as documented through a certifying agency. There would be something that would have some sort of documentation that would need to, uh, to be presented um, at the time the person's trying to receive their license. So there would be some sort of documentation system, and I'm sure it would be spelled out in the bill. Um, if not, a lot of times there are things that are called technical amendments, um, and they can actually be offered on the third day of consideration as well. Um, and technical amendments a lot of times are clarifying or there was an error in drafting the bill, and the technical amendment is just kind of correcting it so it will be applicable. So for example, there, there may be a technical amendment to this uh, where it would read as the requirement for anyone to get their license includes a minimum, te minimum test scores and 40 hours of certified driver training um, as certified by the Department of Transportation. So there would be a, maybe a technical amendment to resolve that. Gentlemen, uh, over here. Oh, go ahead, sorry, back there, go ahead. Yep, that's fine. Um, so would a person at 15 be too young and too immature to operate a motor vehicle on the road with other people? To, what, would that cause potential hazards? Um, yes. <laughs> but at 15, they would only be getting their permit at that point in time, so their driving would be supervised, correct? Yes. Okay. If you want to pass it all the way in the back to Mr. Evans back there. So uh, just to clarify, so the uh, minimum yeah. test scores and like standards to get a license now would have to be raised. This bill would increase the uh, minimum test scores. So while, you know, going to get a license, the requirements to get a license would entail much more experience and training than it is now, right? And there was one over here to the right. For, okay. someone, for someone who's above the age of 15, so say 16 or 17, would they still be held accountable to have um, required test scores and um, 40 hours of driving? 
So the question was, if somebody's over 15, are they still held to the standard, which is the last sentence, which is requires minimum test scores and 40 hours of training? And the answer was yes. Yes, they just need to have one, one year after they get their permit to get their license. Sorry for braiding you, Mike, but um, so is there a reason why it's 40 hours? Because the actual thing is 65. So is, is there a reason why you guys lowered it to 40? And by the way, anybody else on the committee, um, you know, the, the chair, sorry, fire call. The chair of the committee, you guys jinxed me earlier asking if my page was going to go off. Um, the chair of the committee, by the way, if any of the committee members want to chime in, um, so it's not fully on him to answer the questions, you can. Um, so we aren't putting Representative uh, McDevitt on the spot here. Is anybody else on the committee want to chime in with some of the feedback on why you guys came to this decision? And, and by the way, the gentleman can answer if he wants to, but if other people want to chime in on why you guys made those decisions, feel free. Okay, so um, the limit of 40 hours, that was just like a generalization we were the, under the impression that of that at the time that that was already the limit um, set now so if that's not the limit then you know we propose a technical amendment so this would be a good time for an amendment if somebody wants to offer an amendment does anybody want to offer an amendment I would like to move an amendment so that the uh, minimum hours is 65 uh, so it'll be increased from 65 instead of increased from 40, to be more accurate. That's fair. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. I'll second as well. Okay. So the, the, there's been an amendment posted and an amendment seconded. Um, now what we would do is we would go, so you spoke on the amendment already. So now we would actually go to Mr. McDevitt to see if he has any comments on the amendment. Now what you can do is you can speak out and say why it's a bad idea or you can make it, you can say this is an agreed to amendment um, if it's so desired. Um, so you would have a chance to speak back on the issue. Do you care to speak on it? You good? So does that mean you're agreeing to the amendment or? Okay, so the, the, the gentleman is agreeing to the amendment. Are there any other questions on the amendment? And to be clear, the amendment takes the 40 hours and, and moves it to 65 hours and that is to match current law, correct? Okay, it's been a long time since I got my license, folks. Um, so anyways, all right, are there any further questions on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment will raise their hand. Anyone opposed to the amendment? Okay, so the amendment passes. So the bill now sits as amended. Now we'll go back to recognizing the general lady. Um, I just want to know how the minimum test scores, what would be defined as um, the minimum test score and how, how would that have to do with um, the 15 year olds driving? Would that just make them more accountable for um, driving, or what does that have to do with the driving? Does anybody from the committee wish to stand for interrogation to answer that? The gentleman behind you, Mr. Evans? Uh, yes. Um, so we at the Transportation Committee strongly believe that, um, you know, being able to drive is not everything to do with age. It is more to do with experience. Uh, so we believe that raising the minimum um, test scores and standards to pass would uh, greatly benefit the general public, meaning that to be a driver, no matter what age, you have to be more experienced. It's, so um, whatever the minimum test scores are now to pass would be raised. All those in favor of House Bill 5 as amended on the floor, please raise their hands. Hold them high, please. All those opposed? The bill passes as amended. One, I really want to thank you for participating. I want to thank Nishami for hosting us, the teachers, administrators, um, the people that volunteered, took time away from work to help the dialogue today. Um, you know, Representative Fitzpatrick's staff, Senator Tomlinson's staff, of course, my staff, um, you know, the people that, that are lobbyists here that are actually lobbyists as a career. Um, I want to thank all those folks because we couldn't have done it without them. Our folks that came in from Harrisburg, so we have this learning experience. So I want to run through a couple of these bills and tell you, tell you the real deal with them. House Bill 1, the plastic bag bill, was actually my bill. I know it's very unpopular amongst you guys. I could spend an hour explaining why it's actually important to the Commonwealth. Um, 
That bill passed the House by one vote. It barely passed the Senate. And then it was vetoed by Governor Wolf. So he vetoed that in June. Um, sad like casinos. Uh, H Ashley, how big is my, the gaming bill? My, mine. Yeah. So it, it, it's a gaming bill. It's this thick. Um, we have a casino, Parks Casino, right down the road. Employs 2,100 people, many of which live in our district here. And there was a movement afoot to put VGTs, so they're almost like video gaming. They are video gaming terminals in bars across the Commonwealth. Well, they would be like mini slot machines. Well, they were going to hurt the jobs here. Um, it would have fed into greater gambling addiction because people could just go to the corner tavern, get some wings, watch the Eagles, have a beer, and gamble their paycheck away, which would be a really bad thing for society. Um, and there were a lot of moving parts with that. So working with the casinos, um, we came up with this, this bill for the satellite casinos, and it was part of a comprehensive package that actually got signed into law. But the bill itself, with, with, it's like this thick, the bill that we introduced. So as part of the budget where there were all these huge bills put together, that was part of it. So that actually got signed into law. The tanning regulation bill was signed into law by Governor Corbett. That was also a bill I authored. Um, there was some debate in the committee about uh, mandating education in schools and things of that nature. Part of what was in the bill that became law, that we didn't have room. We didn't have room to fit in here because we, we had to condense this to a few, each bill, each bill to a few sentences so that it wasn't too cumbersome. But uh, that bill required warning signs. It required the training of, of staff in the tanning salons. Uh, it required an informed consent form for everybody, whether you're 17, 18, an adult, to sign it. So for those that were on the track of thinking there needs to be greater education on it and those sort of things, we did have some of that in the bill and some more disclosure actions. The immunity for first responders, uh, breaking out windows to save animals that are in distressing cars. Uh, that bill is actually in the Senate right now. That was also a bill I authored. So that is over in the Senate, hopefully getting some action on it soon. Uh, driving age I haven't been involved with. Fireworks I actually fought. For those that don't know, I've been the fire chief of Langhorn for longer than you've all been alive, actually. And the fireworks stuff is bad. People think it's cool. Hey, we can just go buy fireworks and whatnot but it's gonna cause more fires, it's gonna cause more people to be hurt, it's gonna cause firefighters to be hurt, and for the little bit of tax revenue the state's gonna get for it, it's blood money in my mind, and I think it's very bad. Unfortunately, it became law. Um, it was all part of the budget package. Online gaming, uh, Sean Schaefer that was here, uh, somebody that's on the gaming committee commented about online gaming potentially costing jobs at parks. I don't know who that was, but you were dead on. That was again part of that gaming bill that we were trying to fight um, because if you can sit on your couch and play video gaming and actually bet, you're not going down to the casino that cost you know, $50 million to build and that a lot of money was spent and there's a lot of jobs there and there's a lot of important things. Whether you like gaming or not, it, it's legal now, it's a job creator, it generates a lot of tax revenue for the Commonwealth and to allow it to be online is going to hurt the physical facilities and, and that's gonna be bad for Pennsylvania's economy. Um, the other bills I haven't really been involved in, um, they haven't really been moving as best I can tell. Red light uh, traffic enforcement um, is legal. Um, it, in Philadelphia they have it and we do get revenue from it. But that's kind of a quick rundown of the bills. I appreciate your patience with this because we really tried to cram what takes a lot of time into a little window, but we wanted to kind of give you a little thumbnail, something a little representative of what really goes on. and. We have one more thing we need to do. Can somebody give me a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, what's your last name? Uh, Sheed. Sheed, motion to adjourn, thank you, Ms. Sheed. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Sheed, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so we're adjourned.